I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility class. Here I'm going to be talking about the doctrine of attorney work product. I'm going to cover the basics. Attorney work product is related to the duty of confidentiality and attorney client privilege, but it has its own set of rules and exceptions. This is tested on the MPRE and the multi state bar exam as a topic of evidence. The other thing I want to say about this before we really dive in here is that in practice, work product is a rule of evidence. In other words, what's admissible at trial and therefore what's going to be discoverable during pretrial discovery. In practice, this almost always comes up during pretrial discovery when one party has filed a production request on the other side and the one that's on the receiving end of that says, I shouldn't have to turn over those documents or um, uh, photographs or files or whatever it is because I think it's protected work product. So in practice, this usually comes up as an objection to a production request. In, um, it, but uh, for purposes of an exam question, you should be aware that there are elements and exceptions and some subtle differences between this and attorney client privilege. So let's dive in. Let's start with our basic definition. And if you're looking for um, extra background reading to do about this, the uh, probably the most authoritative place to go is the restatement of the law uh, governing lawyers, uh, section chapter or section 87. And that's where I'm going to draw some of the content for these slides from. Work product is tangible material or its intangible equivalent, but not underlying facts themselves. That's, and the, um, the material is, has to be prepared by a lawyer or someone for litigation. And the litigation can be like pending, already filed, or reasonably anticipated in the foreseeable future. There's two types of work product. Opinion work product, which consists of the opinions or mental impressions of a lawyer. And then everything else, all other work product, which we would normally call ordinary work product. Okay, so um, the restatement gives a nice example that sort of illustrates this and highlights at the outset the difference between work product and privilege. Let's say there's a lawyer who's representing an, a corporate, a company that's an employer, and it's about a, a the employer is going to be a potential defendant in litigation. In other words, they're worried about a lawsuit, so they've contacted their lawyer. and. Uh, let's say the litigation is about um, uh, someone who, an employee who died at the workplace because of something that happened, um, maybe exposure to some fumes or uh, toxic materials, or they uh, uh, they fell from uh, off of a ladder or something like that. So the lawyer writes to a physician that the lawyer knows, setting out the circumstances of an employee's death and asking for the physician's opinion as to the cause of death. In the letter, the lawyer explains that the lawyer is preparing for a possible claim by the employee's executor for workers' compensation benefits, or a tort claim, let's say, and that he would like to know the physician's thoughts about the death and whether it could have been caused by the workplace circumstances or if uh, some, there were other pre-existing conditions, let's say, that would have had to be present. So in this type of case, the lawyer's letter in this scenario is protected work product. But note that it's not covered under attorney-client privilege. Why? Well, privilege covers communications between a lawyer and a client and not between a lawyer and anyone else. And this is a communication with a third party, a doctor, that the lawyer is trying to get um, some advice from or consulting with. It could be work product, but it's not privilege. So make sure you understand that if the what the other party is asking um, to see the letter and the doctor's response during pretrial discovery, the lawyer would need to object that that's work product and not say that's covered by attorney client privilege or the duty of confidentiality. So what do we mean by in anticipation of litigation? As I write here, work product doctrine applies only to materials prepared in anticipation of litigation. Note that that's different from attorney-client privilege, which can apply to 
uh, transactional work or even an initial consultation where there's no subsequent representation or uh, the parties the, the or the lawyer decide not to pursue the matter this has to be in anticipation of litigation it, the litigation doesn't have to be like right around the corner or imminent it applies when the primary motivating purpose behind the creation of the document was to aid in possible future litigation. As most law students know, for a lot of types of claims, there's going to be a two-year or three-year statute of limitations. So, and a lot of plaintiff's lawyers will wait until the tail end or the last week of the statute of limitations to file a claim for various reasons. So the, the anticipated litigation could be two or three years off in the future um, based on uh, this doctrine that would still be reasonable anticipation of litigation. And what do we mean by reasonable? Well, there's kind of three types of things. A an outside event that is likely to generate litigation, like the one I have pictured here, a train wreck, a car accident, uh, an employee dies at the workplace, an assault, uh, something like that, um, an obvious breach of contract, uh, secondly, it could be that an, another party has simply threatened to sue. Uh, so they sent a demand letter saying, um, if you don't pay up, we are going to pursue this in the courts or, or, or sue you. Well, that's an express threat of a lawsuit. So now you have reasonable anticipation of litigation from that point forward. In somewhat more rare, it's not that rare, but um, uh, one party's own internal actions, for example, you're slowly preparing to build a lawsuit or to, to bring a lawsuit against another party. So let's say you're thinking about bringing a, a, a let's say a patent infringement claim or some sort of antitrust claim, something like that, um, that could take a few years of laying the groundwork and trying to document things and, and so forth uh, in anticipation of that. Well, because you're planning on eventually when you have enough evidence put together, uh, uh, initiating litigation, that would be an reasonable anticipation of litigation. Now, this is a very important part of uh, work product doctrine to make sure you understand, and that's the big exception, which is need and hardship. And we define this as the other party uh, has a substantial need for the material, and I mean a real need for the material in order to prepare for trial. And by that we mean it's relevant to the litigation and material or prejudicial. And they are not able to just get it themselves. So if you found a case on Westlaw, well, they could find cases on Westlaw themselves, although I'm going to come back to that point. But they, this is something that they can't recreate without undue hardship. So it's either impossible or um, ex exorbitantly expensive to obtain the substantial equivalent of the material through other means than you just turning it over. So make sure you understand that need and hardship does not mean merely like, why should we have to find this evidence if you already have it? It means we will never be able to get this evidence that you have, and therefore um, the judge should order you to turn it over. And so basically this is their, you are going to object to their produ production request during pretrial discovery that this is protected by work product, and then they're going to say, oh, but we're invoking the need and hardship exception. The judge is going to decide and either decide work product applies, that you don't have to turn it over, or the need and hardship exception applies, so you do have to turn it over. How do we define hardship? Well, substantially equivalent material is not available, or if available, only through cost and effort that's substantially disproportionate to the amount at stake in the litigation and the value of the information to the inquiring party. Um, note that this is usually going to be easier to show after other discovery has been completed. So you don't just do this at the beginning of the discovery phase. It's going to be easier to convince a judge that you really can't get the information any other way if we've discovery has been going on for a long time and you've tried other means, made good faith efforts to get the information yourself and you realize now that you can't. A really common situation is uh, the, a prior statement by a witness who's now uh, become unavailable because of death or uh, they've left the jurisdiction, nobody knows where they are. Another example that um, the restatement has used is, uh, let's say there was a traffic accident at an intersection and the injured party um, talks to a lawyer the next day and the lawyer goes to the intersection and takes pictures from every angle hoping to show whose fault it was or things, issues about visibility. Um, could you see the stop sign and so on? 
And so let's say that the claim is going to be that one of the parties ran a stop sign um, and you're anticipating that they're going to say they couldn't see the stop sign or they couldn't see other cars coming. Well, let's say that the other party doesn't do that. And then a few months later, something happens and the town cuts down a bunch of trees, new roads get built, uh, or I'm sorry, businesses get built at the intersection, the whole view changes, or uh, maybe they uh, uh, take down the stop sign and replace it with a stop light uh, or something like that. So when the case is finally in court, the other side goes to the intersection and it doesn't look at all like it did at the time of the accident. Well, that's a text-based textbook case for where your photographs from the intersection at the time, the day after the accident, uh, they wouldn't be able to reproduce. And so you're probably going to have to turn them over. Okay, what counts as work product? Lots of stuff. Tangible materials like documents, photographs, diagrams, sketches, questionnaires and surveys, financial analyses, handwritten notes, digital material, files, and so forth. Um, also, intangible work product is equivalent uh, to work product in unwritten oral or, un or remembered form. And so, for example, um, the lawyer's recollections from an oral conversation, even if you, uh, let's say, didn't take notes at the time. I have here um, a, an example of somebody uh, drawing on a flip chart or a whiteboard in a like one of these uh, a brainstorming session. That would be um, protected work product. Probably wouldn't be protected by attorney-client privilege if a lot of people are present. Compilations and summaries of non-work product materials can be work product like a lawyer's memorandum analyzing publicly available information. For example, the, case, the relevant case law or a 50-state um, survey of statutes, the other side could just do that themselves, right? And so uh, that is going to be work product. You did the work. You had sort of the uh, analytical ability and the knowledge to know how to do this. And so selection and arrangement of documents that would not otherwise be protected in trial pr preparation can reflect mental impressions and legal opinions. Um, a lawyer's index of a client's pre-existing and discoverable business files or the relevant case law would be work product if prepared in anticipation of litigation. Um, so I'm going to give an example if, for law students who have used Westlaw or Lexis. Um, uh, number one, if you let's say you're a summer associate and you're asked to do a research memo and you write a memo kind of summarizing the relevant case law in your jurisdiction. Well, that memo is going to be work product, even though it wasn't produced by the attorney. And even though all you're doing is discussing cases that are a matter of public record, case opinions. Um, so now let's say that you downloaded all of the cases you cited and put them on a flash drive or on the uh, firm's um, uh, network, uh, or you printed them all out and put them together in a binder and gave them to the partner with your memo as sort of a cover memo. Well, even your compilation of cases will be protected work product because it kind of shows your thought process, what cases you thought were relevant, how you arranged them, maybe your markups on them and so forth. Even uh, let's say on Westlaw, you print out your search results, the list of cases from one of your searches, even though the other side um, could replicate that and, it's, uh, and get the same thing, <clears throat> it shows your mental thought that you thought of how to do a certain search and confine your search parameters and so forth. And so the list of cases would be protected work product, even though you didn't write any of those cases and you didn't write the list, but you wrote the query that generated the list. Okay, so let's talk about some things that are not work product. Materials assembled in the ordinary course of business. There's a lot of litigation about this uh, uh, point. So things like business records and fine, uh, um, uh, profit reports and earnings reports and so forth um, <clears throat> are uh, usually not going to be work product. The employee manual won't be work product and so forth. Materials created pursuant to public requirements. So you compile um, a, a bunch of materials to file with the tax returns. Um, your, your corporate tax returns or personal tax returns are not attorney work product just because an attorney prepared them, right? You have, there's a legal obligation to file those. 
um, and also materials that the party would create regardless of any anticipated litigation. And so, for example, let's say you have an employer that takes attendance or has um, uh, timesheets that people fill out or um, a, a clock where they a time clock where they uh, punch in and punch out at the end of their shift beginning and end of their shift so they're going to keep that just to kind of track who is coming in on time or um, at late who's leaving early and so forth um, and now those can become relevant in litigation later on if you have, let's say, a wrongful termination suit, but the, the employer is keeping those regardless, right? And so collecting those, so those aren't really work product. Um, underlying facts are not work product, and this can be confusing for people. Work product does not apply merely because the underlying fact was discovered through a lawyer's effort or is recorded only in an otherwise protected work product. So for example, in a lawyer's file memorandum. And so it won't apply to names of witnesses, whether a witness recounts a particular version of events, um, whether a traffic light was red or green, um, if assuming the other party actually um, asks this. But recordings or transcripts of the verbatim contents of the witness statements would be protected. So make sure that you understand that. Now, what do you have to uh, invoke work product protection during discovery and usually it comes up after the other side has said, hey, we want your notes um, about this or we want those documents or those photographs or those files or business records. So what's the process here? Um, the party who's, that's invoking the work product has to object it. In, uh, object. You actually have to raise it. It doesn't just, tr it's not auto, automatically tr self triggering. And so, in other words, if you don't bring it up, you waive it. Um, and if the other side uh, uh, objects, then you might be forced to demonstrate each element of the immunity. In other, in other words, it's, we're not just going to take your word for it that's work product. You're going to have to show that. It was prepared um, in reasonable anticipation of litigation. The opposing party, if they say, no, I'm in, uh, but I have a need and hardship, and so therefore work product should not apply, or uh, should, I should, uh, we should apply the exception, they're also going to have to demonstrate um, each element of the waiver exception. So notice that there's basically a shifting burden here um, that happens. Okay, now, it's easy to get confused about this, and I want to show you something that happened in uh, a 10 day period in August of 2018 with some federal courts. So, on August 1st, 2018, a federal court in Ohio wrote that work product doctrine is actually broader than the attorney client privilege. You don't have to worry about the case citation, I just have it there so you believe me. Um, the um, one week later, a federal court in a district court in Texas wrote a work product doctrine is narrower than the attorney client privilege. Well, that seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? And two days after that, we have a federal court in Florida that says work product doctrine is broader than attorney client privilege. How can this all be true? Which is, which is it? Well, let me explain. In one sense, work product is broader because anyone can create protected work product if motivated by anticipated litigation. So it doesn't just have to be communications between the client and the lawyer. Let's say um, the uh, lawyer could, in, uh, for a corporate client, could instruct the human resources department to start keeping tracking things like attendance or uh, um, employee complaints or something like that very carefully because they're expecting a lawsuit. Well, that's then going to be work product. And work product doctor, uh, can include more items, documents, photos, translations, article compilations, and so forth that wouldn't be covered under attorney-client privilege. It's also broader because it's more robust. It's pretty hard to waive attorney-client privilege unless you just forget to bring it up at trial as an objection. So disclosing work product to non-adverse third parties normally does not waive the litigation. I want to make sure you understand this. If you have a, a, a private conversation with your client or send a letter to your client, that would normally be protected by attorney-client privilege. But if your client recounts the conversation to a friend or shows the letter to some other people like friends and associates, they have waived privilege. So it's really easy. Uh, privilege in that sense is kind of fragile. 
Well, with work product, if you create a turning work product, it doesn't matter if the client has showed it to 10 other people, it's probably still going to be a, a work product. So in that sense, it's broader because it's more robust. It's harder to, um, to undo with mere waiver. On the other hand, work product is narrower because it only applies in anticipation of litigation, whereas attorney-client privilege can apply in transactional matters or just kind of general consultations about the best way to do things to avoid liability um, or to comply with the, the requirement, regulatory compliance. So um, com compliance work uh, discussions might be privileged, um, <clears throat> but might not be covered by attorney work product. And um, it's uh, easily overcome by the need and hardship uh, uh, exception, right? Which doesn't really apply uh, to attorney-client privilege in the same way. And so hopefully you can, uh, can see that there's senses in which uh, one, each one is broader and each, uh, than the other and senses in which they're narrower. And that concludes our lecture about the work product doctrine.